Well, good morning. Great to see you today, and thank you for the privilege of being here. I have a son and a daughter-in-law who both graduated from Liberty. We have a lot of students here from Liberty, from the state of Arkansas and Northwest Arkansas. And we've had several staff members, or have several staff members who are graduates of Liberty. I've served on the board here years ago, and it's a privilege to be back on campus today. I really believe that one of the major heartbeats of this university, and I promise you, it was the core of your founder who constantly asked himself and dealt with this subject continually. How God wants to use you to reach the world for Jesus Christ. That absolutely consumed him and it still consumes the core nature of what this university is all about. And just as Johnny said a moment ago, it is true that we have to ask ourselves today and really every day of our lives, one of the real important, powerful, and penetrating questions. And that question is, what is my part in God's big plan to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Here is God who has this massive plan to redeem every person so that one day every nation, tribe, people, and language will be worshiping at the throne of God during all of eternity. God's got a big plan. And God's going to finish his plan, whether we are not, whether we are involved or not. But I think the more mature question is, what is my part? My part in God's big plan of reaching this world for Jesus Christ. I'll never forget it was 1987 on a Wednesday night when a lanky young man walked into the congregation in Northwest Arkansas that I pastored. He had just moved from the great state of Tennessee, and he was a graduate of the University of Tennessee. Any volunteer fans here today? Thank you. He had been working for Tyson Foods, but he was moved to the global headquarters of Tyson, which is located in our region. And today I want to tell you about my friend, who I believe is one of the greatest laymen that I've ever met in my life, and I personally believe he's one of the greatest laymen in all of the world. He is a man who is passionately committed to Jesus Christ, a man that God uses to win people to Christ, a man that God uses to disciple people to Christ, and a man who is a tremendous Bible teacher, a great student of God's Word. But this man also is a man who understands his skill, his gifts, and all these years, God has worked mightily in his life, and he has now been raised up as the president and the CEO of Tyson Foods. His name is Donnie Smith. Tyson Foods is the largest beef and poultry producer in the world. Last year, $34.4 billion of revenue. He supervises 115,000 employees globally. But additionally, beyond what Donnie does at his job and what he does through the ministry of Cross Church, the church that I pastor, Donnie has a huge heart for caring for people. And he has a huge heart for people coming to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Donnie Smith created using his own skill and his own expertise, what is called an organization, African Sustainable Agricultural Project, a project that he himself is involved in and funds. It's there to equip African farmers in principles of agriculture, enable agricultural entrepreneurship, and enrich African lives, communities, and countries. Why does he do this? He does this because he knows of the great needs in the country of Africa from a humanitarian side. 
but he also does it using his skill, using his expertise in agriculture, not only for the purposes of compassion, but for the ultimate purpose of being able to introduce those people to faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You see, here is the point. He is understanding, even as a major layperson in a local church, and even as a corporate leader in America, he has discovered his part in God's plan to reach the world for Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas had just been commissioned by the church at Antioch to finish the task of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. After they sailed away and traveled some, they came to a city that was also called Antioch in a place called Pisidia. And there in that setting, Paul went immediately to the synagogue and he began to preach to them about Jesus Christ and even talking to them about one of their great heroes by the name of David, one of the former kings. In fact, he compared David to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 13, verse number 22, these words, listen carefully, after removing him, meaning Saul was removed as king, notice what happens, the Bible says, he raised up David as their king and testified about him I have found the son of Jesse, a man loyal to me. Some translations, a man after God's own heart, willing to do, willing to carry out all of my will. And that's exactly what David was. David was a man who chased after the heart of God. Now, this is pretty big because you have to understand, David has spent much of his life in messiness, He had made so many mistakes in his life, some of them massively. And some of you, when you even think about David, you think perhaps more about the mistake than the point that he is the only man in all of God's word where God said, he is a man after my own heart. That ought to encourage all of us because many of us come from a past of messiness, but we can still get through all of the messiness and God can use us in a mighty, mighty way. The Bible goes on and talks in Acts 13 about how Paul goes on and he talks to them about Jesus Christ and how Christ had died for the sins of the world and how he'd been raised from the dead, stating specifically that the body of Jesus Christ did not decay. And then he pointed them back to their hero named David. And listen to the words written in Acts chapter 13, verse number 36, that I believe are absolutely some of the most profound and powerful words found anywhere in the entire Word of God. Acts 13, 36 says, for David, listen to this, after serving his own generation in God's plan. Now think about that statement, after serving his own generation, his own era of time, In God's plan, he fell asleep. That doesn't mean he got tired and fell asleep. He was not in a classroom. No. He had not been out all night before. No, he died. That's what it meant. And when he died, the Bible says he was buried with our fathers. But notice the distinction. He says specifically, David's body decayed. Now, because David had a heart for God, a mighty heart for God, he was a man who was very committed to fulfilling his purpose in his generation. I mean, what a tremendous statement that is. I wonder today, are you committed to fulfill your purpose in your generation? The scripture says that after David died, his body decayed, unlike Jesus' body that did not decay because he was raised from the dead. You see, David got it. David understood in God's big plan of life. David understood one powerful thing, his part. And he chased after that part. And he ran after that part to fulfill, listen, his purpose in his generation. 
The Bible says that the next week, David went and he preached again. In fact, the crowd was so large because the Bible says all the city came to hear what David had to say. Or excuse me, what, what, uh, what Paul had to say. And when Paul went and he preached the gospel that day and he talked to them about how Christ had died for their sins and was raised from the dead. The scripture states specifically, they resisted the message, they rejected the message, and then Paul gave a mighty pronouncement and announcement about his future. It says, okay, he said, no longer am I going to spend the rest of my life speaking truth to you about Jesus and you reject this truth. No longer am I going to give myself to people who want to remain in darkness, but I'm going to go to the darkness of the darkness, and I'm going to give a light of the gospel to the world, to the people that all of you Jews say are unbelievers, but I believe God wants them to be saved. Listen to the words found in Acts chapter 13, verse 47. God's word says, I have made you... Paul, a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And I want to say to all of you today, we are in the same place that Paul is. It doesn't matter what our major may be in this institution, what our vocational choice may be at this moment in life. God wants to make us a light to all of the nations so that all of the nations can come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. You know, your generation is known for being a generation that wants transparency. You want honesty. You want authenticity. You detest that which is plastic. You detest that which is synthetic. You want the brutal reality and the brutal honesty. Keeping that in mind today, I want to move and I want to tell you with complete, total honesty and unveil to you several things that you must know and grapple with in your generation. For example, let's begin with the spiritual reality around the globe. Do you realize the spiritual reality around the globe? You want the facts, you want the truth, you want the brutal brutal truth and reality, I'm about to give it to you. In this world today, there are 11,256 people groups all across the world. The population of the world today is just over 7 billion people. Listen carefully. And out of that 7 billion people, 3.9 billion people have little to no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ all across this world. Can you imagine that? While you sit here and you listen to the gospel every week and you hear sermon after sermon, you hear biblical truth applied to your life in the academic classroom along the way when it's appropriate, and you are taught a Christian worldview while you're sitting here learning and growing and many times getting so used to it, it doesn't mean anything to you anymore. We live in a world where 3.9 billion people have little to absolutely zero access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a little more facts. There are 6,580 people groups today that have less than 2% of their population engaged to, are in, or have access to the gospel. That means out of that 11,000 plus people groups, there are 6,500 plus of them where we have no evidence of, of, of anything close to 2% of that population having access to the gospel. And then you take 6,580 of those people groups and you look at it even a little more focused, listen carefully to me, There are 3,030 of those people groups who are completely unengaged, meaning from a human perspective, we do not believe there is absolutely any witness of Jesus Christ found anywhere, nor any kind of strategy to reach those people through church planning. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? 
You say, well, that's the world. So what? What about America? What about North America? I'm glad you asked. When you look at North America, let me tell you, we have our own issues. We have 259 million people in North America out of the 300 million plus that have no relationship with Jesus Christ, would never proclaim to know the Lord, would never proclaim being born again by the Spirit of God and having a life-changing experience with Christ. Therefore, the next time you walk across and you travel across North America, here's the way I want you to look at it, that three out of four people in North America have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is brutal reality. That is absolute genuine facts. Facts of researchers, missiologists across the world, and that's exactly the status of where our globe is spiritually. Let me cut down to it real quick. We are lost in this world, and there is a desperate need for the good news of Jesus Christ. But let's go to the biblical reality. Now that we know the facts, what does the Bible say? You know, the Bible is real clear. We live in a fallen world, an evil world. Every one of us, we have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says when we die, we enter into an eternity. An eternity of heaven or an eternity of hell. Do you believe that? The Bible says as well, there's only one way to God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by me. While this secular culture wants to establish that there are many gods and that there are many paths to God, I want to declare once again, just as been declared from this pulpit hundreds and even thousands of times from the very first chapel service many years ago, there's only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ our Lord, period. And with that being reality... That means that everyone who has never met Christ spends eternity totally separated from God in a place called hell. People are totally separated from God forever throughout all of eternity. So the biblical reality is God has called every one of us to find our part in God's big plan to do one thing, to share the gospel of Christ with a world that is desperately lost and in need of our Savior. But then we have to move to a personal reality. We've talked of spiritual reality, the biblical reality, but here's where it really gets down to you in your life. Because this is, see, this is what it's really all about and what it comes down to you and how you wear that. For example, I want to urge you today to ask yourself two important questions. First question is this, what will I give my life to? I mean, can you imagine this? You have got a long life ahead of you unless you're called out of this world before you would like to go. But what are you going to give your life to? I mean, what is going to be your agenda? Are you going to give your life to something that will not matter? I mean, you know, there is, a, there is a real brutal fact, according to the Word of God, that all of us need to get a hold of as well. I've been talking about it with my people the last couple of weeks, and it's this reality. It is a grim financial fact. You didn't bring anything into this world, and you will not take anything out of this world, period. So when you live your life and you go through your life in this world, you didn't bring anything in, and you're not taking anything out. So if you're not careful, you will be like much of the culture today and live your life in complete vanity. And what are you going to give your life to? I mean, God didn't bring you to Liberty University for you to simply chart a pathway for the rest of your life that is selfish. Oh, no. He brought you here by his sovereign plan to indent your life, to impact your life, whereby you have to wrestle with one of the great questions of life, like, what am I going to give my life to for the rest of my life? And there's a second question. Oh, we've already talked about it today. What is my part in God's plan to reach the world for Jesus Christ? You know, I learned over the last several days that 90% of you 
who are students at Liberty University, you major in one of the 300 programs offered by this great academic institution. And then 10% of you are majoring in some program relating to ministry. I want to talk to both groups specifically as we move towards our final time together. A word to those of you that are the 90%. Let me ask you, will you use your vocation, your giftedness, your skill, like my friend Donnie Smith, and live for Jesus Christ, make an impact for God, and go to the nations so that they might know? Let me ask you today another question. Will you consider, rather than living a life in North America, will you consider going to some of the great lost cities across the world, even in your vocational choice, using your skill and your giftedness, whether it be Shanghai, Dubai, Mumbai, or whatever city you want to go to across the world? and use your giftedness to extend the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. You've already heard a testimony today about global studies and using it as a minor. Why is that important? That's important because we have to understand whether we go across the world or we stay here in America. It's real clear. This landscape of culture is changing. And we are in the realm of an international culture and environment, and we better know how to operate in order to be successful in what we do. And then I ask you this question, is God calling you to change your future? I mean, could it be that he has brought you here, 90% of you, to consider giving your life in a different path and direction than what you see it going at the present time in your life? I mean, can you imagine calling mom or dad or your family sometime in the next few days? You know, mom or dad, I know that I was committed to majoring in this and I was committed to do this in my life, but I tell you the other day, God got a hold of me and I know now, I know now that, that, that that's not where I'm going, but in a convocation and beyond that convocation, God worked on my heart and God is calling me to give my life completely to the reaching of the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to introduce you to another friend of mine. His name is Dave Kinney. Dave is newly married to Emily. Both came out of our church. He just graduated from Baylor University just a little over a year ago. You know what Dave was going to do? Dave was going to be a doctor. Dave was, was in his final prep moments for attending medical school. And I'm telling you, out of nowhere, let me tell you what God did with him. God called David to ministry. Can you imagine that? Emily married a doctor. And all of a sudden, her husband is going to be a minister. Dave was pretty green. He didn't know what in the world and how to handle it. But he had heard that our church had just started a ministry called the Cross Church School of Ministry. It's a one-year residency program, kind of like a doctor has, a residency, where God called men and women come and they live with us for one year and we prepare them for life and ministry and gospel advancement globally. We have partnership with several universities and seminaries where they can gain credit while they're with us as much as 18 hours. At crosschurchschool.com, we talk about that ministry. Dave came on board and was a part and is a part of that. And now after all this time, God is charting his future and he's learning and growing to become God's man to do what he can do so he can find God's part in reaching the world for Jesus Christ. I wanna urge you today, there may be some Dave Kinney's in this room. There may be several of you. There may be two or 300 of you or more that may say, you know what? I can identify with that because that's where I am. And I really believe God may wanna call me to ministry. But then what about the 10% of you that we talked about a moment ago that are already called to ministry? You're already studying for ministry. Can I ask you a question today? Why don't you surrender your life 
like Paul did and go to the Gentile nations? Why don't you surrender your life to vocational missions, leaving this country and going to try to reach some of the people of that four billion who have little to no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why don't you give your life to the finishing of the task of the Great Commission? Why don't you consider changing matters in your life where I mean you're committed? You say, no, Ronnie, I know God wants me to lead and minister here in North America. If he does, then listen carefully. Why don't you go to parts of North America that are so lost, so vacant, in a desperate need for Jesus Christ, and do ministry there? Why don't you go to some of the underserved areas of our nation that need gospel churches like Wyoming and Idaho and Utah and so many others up in the Northeast who need a strong gospel church. Oh, listen today, it's not that people in the North are more lost than people in the South or people in Africa are more lost than people in America. No, that's not the issue. The issue is access, access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to do everything we can to give them access to being saved. Would you consider that today? You know, just two weeks or so ago, I read a story, and what a powerful story it was. I mean, this story kind of jacks me up because in reality, I, I really hope you get it. Your generation may be the first generation that has ever lived that literally could complete the Great Commission, where every Nation, tribe, people, and language could come to know Christ. I mean, you live in that kind of world today, and it's on your watch. I close with this story today. Did you hear the remarkable story a couple of weeks ago about the neurosurgeon from Alabama? The story was published on February the 1st, 2014. He was at one hospital in Birmingham, but he was needed six miles away at another hospital because someone needed emergency brain surgery. In fact, he had already been told when he was told to come that it was 90% certainty of death and 10% possibility of survival. This neurosurgeon was moved immediately And in this horrible day of weather, he got in his car, in his scrubs, and he began to make his way to the other hospital. He barely got a few blocks, and I mean lockdown and traffic happened in Birmingham, and nothing was moving. And this neurosurgeon, in this horrible weather, got out of his car, and he told him on his cell phone, I'm walking six miles to come and help this man save his life. They notified all of the authorities to be looking for this doctor walking in his scrubs in this horrible weather and help him and bring him here because a man's life is at stake. And the story says that they could not find this doctor. But after a period of time, the hospital door opens. He walks in and he sees this family and finds him and he says, I'm going to do surgery. And he made it walking through six miles trying to save that man's life in his scrubs on a horrible, cold, frigid, snowy day in this unique moment of snow. The man's life was saved. He saved his life. It became a major national story. And when they showed and they interviewed this neurosurgeon, He talked about how this patient was going to die, but he walked six miles to save his life, and he was trying to help them make sense of why he would do it. And he said, this man's life was at stake, and I needed to try to save his life. And listen to what he said. And if I hadn't have done it, he would have died. And then listen to these words. And that's not going to happen on my shift. No. He said, that's not going to happen on my shift. 
that this man is going to die, and I will do whatever I can to save him. And that's exactly what he did. Do you realize today that the vast majority of the world is not hearing the power of Jesus Christ and how he died to save them from their sin? But it is time now for each one of us in this room today and those that are watching and listening across the world, it is time for us today to shift our lives, to shift our resources, to shift our futures, to shift our dreams and shift our desires so that we will ensure that this world comes to faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or at least have the opportunity to say yes or no to the plan of God in their life. And our heart needs to be this. Their spiritual death is not going to happen on our shift. It's on you. And it's on me. And the question is today, what will we do about it if we will do anything? I want us to bow our heads together all across the room today. And as your head is bowed and your eyes are closed today, I want to urge you to give complete attention in these last closing moments. I wonder how many of you today God is calling to use your skill, your vocation, to reach others across the world for Christ. I wonder how many of you would start thinking that way that perhaps have never thought that way. I wonder how many of you that are that 90% that are majoring in those 300 majors would say, you know what, God is calling me to ministry. And while I could do it in my vocation, doing what I'm doing now, I really believe God wants me to shift my life completely and my future completely and surrender my life to vocational missions across the world. I don't know if that's you today, but if you know that you're going to give the rest of your life to trying to find your part in God's plan to reach the world for Christ, I pray today that right where you are, that you will surrender to God in that decision. In fact, if that is your heart and that is your heartbeat today, I wonder one by one all across this room, would you just simply stand one at a time And so, you know what? I'm going to give the rest of my life to finding my part in God's plan. Whether I'm going to be a doctor, whether I'm going to be a nurse, whether I'm going to be a lawyer, whether I'm going to be a businessman, I'm telling you, I'm going to take it seriously. I'm really going to take it seriously. And that's going to be me. And And I always wish you would stand one by one as God speaks to your heart. And I wonder how many of you today, God is calling to ministry, vocational ministry, where vocationally you're going to go to the ends of the earth and share the gospel. If that's you today, why don't you stand one by one? Even some of you that God has already called, and God's calling you to the world today to leave North America one day and to go to the lost ends of the earth, giving your life for the gospel. One by one, would you please stand to your feet? So that's me. I, I, I really believe that. I, I was going to New Hampshire. I was going to back to Alabama. I was going to Arkansas or Texas. But you know what? I really believe that I need to prayerfully consider my future. I'm going to ask Johnny to come and bring closure today, but I want you to remain standing today. And I pray that you will surrender fully. Whether you're seated, whether you're standing, surrender completely. I'm going to stay here just for a couple more minutes because I think this is a a really uh, sacred moment. And uh, what I'd like to do, uh, if you're willing to do this, those of you that are standing, is I'd like you to make a um, uh, make this uh, more than just a moment where you've stood, but a moment where you dedicate yourself individually. You get on your knees in front of God, 
and do that. And so, um, so I'd, I'd just like to invite you to come to the floor here, around the concourse here, get on your knees, um, and, and pray to God. So if you just want to uh, leave your seat, you can come and turn this into one, um, one big altar. And you know, this is, uh, this is not something that we do that often in, in convocation, but this is uh, not a normal moment. Um, I, I really believe, like, looking across uh, this, this crowd, there are uh, millions of people that will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time in their life because of this moment. And uh, I, we have 160 different missionaries here. I, I want to invite you to come. Um, maybe you just see a student. Everybody can't fit here. You can just kind of wrap around the back of the floor. That's fine. Um, in fact, maybe you can kind of go backwards now because we're all, all full up here. I think it's something really powerful about seeing the amount of, of uh, people that God is at this great university, putting them in the bullseye of this important moment. Um, you know, just be quiet for a minute. You can uh, have your own prayer to God. And, and then I want you to kind of put the hand on somebody next to you and just pray for them. You, you don't have to talk or anything. Just, just pray for them. Ask God to uh, protect them, to guide them, to open doors for them, to show them the way. Um, for the rest of us in this room, let's join in those uh, prayers and let's, let's pray for those uh, that are making this call. S some of you are struggling with this in your own heart. Maybe you want to pray uh, yourself. Um, and then uh, we'll close here in just a moment. And by the way, no one should be in, in a hurry here. They're, um, your, your, your faculty and your staff are here for this. That's why they're here, okay? Because we believe uh, we're going to reach the world in our generation. So we'll just have a, a moment of prayer and I'll close it. meet some students around you make a commitment to meet in the next week or so over coffee or to pray together um, some of you you need to take the next step this afternoon whatever that is if you need advice on that email cge at liberty.edu stop by the center for global engagement um, let's just uh, let's just dedicate this moment God, I'm not really quite sure why you've given our generation this important place in history. Objectively speaking, we're the first generation that could actually see the completion of the Great Commission. We're the first one. And it's not inconceivable that in 10 or 20 or 30 years that every single person on planet earth will have had the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you have made us alive at this moment you have given us this responsibility and we today by the thousands join with the the, the statement that we've heard this morning that it's not going to be on our shift we're going to work like everything depends upon us we're going to pray like everything depends upon you. We're going to do what is required. We're not just going to make loose commitments. Like, like We're going to do this thing, and we're going to do it in our generation. So I pray for every single student that, that's making some kind of commitment here 
I, today, I pray for every single one of them that you show them the way. I, this just wouldn't be some passing moment, but that this would be a moment that they think and talk and tell stories about for the rest of their lives and that they, they won't expect you just to do everything for them. You have done it. You have stepped into this moment. You have burdened their hearts. You have called them. You're working in their lives. Now, I pray in Jesus' name that they'll do their part, that they'll make the decisions they need to make, that they'll make the changes they need to make, that they'll move in the direction that you're leading them to go, and that they won't be discouraged by anything that tries to discourage them. I pray that you put a hedge of protection around every single one of them, that you don't let the enemy conspire against what it is you have for them, and that this morning will be a morning that will be quintessential in the completion of the Great Commission. You tell us we have not because we ask not. So I ask for two things. I ask that you allow us to play a key part in finishing this task. Number two, I pray that many people here today on their knees on this floor will have the privilege of giving the gospel to millions to nations, and we believe it will happen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're finished here, you can, but you can stay, you can do what you need uh, to do. God bless you.